What's up, everybody? It's your boy, the nonprofit sector connector, coming at you like I do every single Friday morning from the top of the house, just beneath the roof. That's right, I'm in the attic. Where else would I be, Tommy D, in the attic? You'll hear the song later on, actually. It's the only song in the history of songs that references a guy doing a radio show in his attic. And, I mean, I think it is. I, I'm going to claim that it is. George Ellis is here. George, good morning. Before I even get in, I just want to say good morning. How are you? Doing great, Tommy. Good morning. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you're here. I got a couple of things I want to just say before we get started, George. But this show, again, if you haven't been here before, it's called Philanthropy and Focus. The mission of this program, the mission of really my mission, is to help nonprofits tell their story and amplify their message. I've been doing this now for 80 some odd episodes uh, it's a ton of fun for me. It's it's become, as I say, a mission. It's become what I'm supposed to be doing. Nonprofits change our world, impact our world, social services, education, uh, <laughs> healthcare services, all the different areas, feeding those who need food, uh, clothing those who need clothes. I was just in a discussion the other day, and I, I was at the New York City Imagine Awards, and I was in a discussion the other day because... There were several organizations who were finalists in the New York City Imaginers Awards, which I'll talk about in a second, but who are working towards helping folks with food insecurity. And I turned to the woman next to me and I said, why is this a thing? Like, why do we allow this to even be a situation? Now, this is, a, well, I'm in the city of New York at the time, that there are people who are food insecure. I'm not going to get on my soapbox just yet because we have other things to talk about today, but I will say this. In a society where people have so much, how can anybody have nothing? And that bothers me and it drives me crazy. But guess what the answer is? If the nonprofits aren't there to support these folks and bring them what they need, they don't get what they need. They don't get the support they need. So the point is, until we solve the major problem, organizations like this are there on the front lines doing the work. The New York City Imagine Wars, it was a second annual Imagine Wars, was held the other night. Uh, at a really cool place underneath the 59th Street Bridge called Gustavino's. Really cool place. Like, seriously, I didn't even know. I used to park in a garage there for many, many years, and I didn't even know there was a restaurant uh, a catering spot over there. But Ken Serini's really, uh, this is Ken Serini's dream. And we were living out Ken Serini's dream. My buddy, my pal, Serini and Associates, but founder of the Long Island Imagine Wars and the New York City Imagine Wars. I will tell you this. The Long Island Imagine Wars applications are open right now. There's like a little ticker on their website, 38 days, 13 hours, 55 minutes and 58 seconds. And it literally is ticking down. So that deadline is November 28th, 2022. That's another big event out here in Long Island. That'll be April 25th at Crest Hollow Country Club, where we do many of our big events here on the island. So, all right, listen, without further ado, I want to get into our conversation with a new friend of mine, George Ellis, the executive director of the Waterfront Center, which none of this happens, George, if it's not for connections. None of this happens if... My friend, Jamey Crowder, doesn't text me one day and say, Tommy D, I'm making a move. I've landed at the Waterfront Center. I want you to know about it. I want you to come out and visit. And that's what the power of the connection is, man. That's the whole thing. And I say this all the time. If it isn't for like people, oh, Tommy D, you're so great. And I go, thank you. No, I, <laughs> but they go, you're so great. You're so, you do so much. I go, yeah, but I just want to help. And I can't help unless I have the connections. I can't help without my social capital. So when I'm able to pull certain things off, like call the, the Queen's Chamber of Commerce and say, hey, look, there's an anti-puppy mill bill up in New York State. We'd like to get your support. I know the chamber is going up there. The chamber put that on their legislative agenda when they went up to Albany. And they didn't do that just because, you know, I'm some guy who called them. It's relationships, it's connections. I was on the phone with my buddy Tom Gretsch from the chamber, CEO of the Queen's Chamber this morning. So this is that this is how it all goes. It's all about relationships and connections. So shout out to you, Jermaine. Thanks for making a connection to George. Thank you for having my boys and I, my two sons and I, we came out, we helped paint the basement uh, you know, a few months ago. Hashtag 60 days of service. That was fun. Uh, George, it started out where we realized we thought we had two different colors blues when we were okay. starting to paint. So Cameron and the guys and the gals, we were like in Lauren and all where like, uh oh, and it, but it was so cool because it was like a, a blue sea blue color. And we're talking about the waterfront center. So I'd okay. like to I'd like to just start off with with you sort of saying, you know, we talked about this earlier you're different from other folks who lead organizations as you're, you're not a perennial nonprofit executive director. You, you come from the other side, you come from for-profit, you have a background, but you're connected to the water, you're connected to the community. 
let's just kind of start there. And what, what, how did you even get involved with the Waterfront Center as a volunteer, as a board member, things like that? Well, let me first start by saying, you know, thank you for having us on the show and for what you do. Because, I mean, the fact that you bring to light what nonprofits do and try to connect nonprofits, it's really an amazing thing. Um, I'm not personally familiar with anybody else that does that. Um, and, and it's, and it's, you know, every nonprofit, it struggles to try and get their word out. Right. Um, so the fact that you do this is pretty amazing, but the other amazing thing is that you put your money where your mouth is, right. You're not just doing a show and talking about it. You actually come and experience it like you did with the waterfront center. And so you came with your sons and you, and you painted the basement and then, you know, you had pizza with us and it was, it was a great experience and the whole team really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so, folks. You got, well, I appreciate the gratitude. I, I've yeah. learned at this point in my life to accept yeah. it and not just say, oh, yeah, no big deal. No, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for saying it. And you got a great team out there. I had a lot of fun with them. Another day, I don't think you were around, but I came to, um, we did some Italian ices. Shout out to my dad, yeah. Ralph, Ralph Sices in Huntington. You got great people out there, man. I have a lot of fun with them. And and uh, I, I'd like to spend more time actually going to the website this morning. I'm just going, man, there's so much cool stuff going on out there, especially. Right. We'll get into it, but especially like on the education side, and we'll talk about you know the uh, uh, the oyster sloop. Is that the right word, Christine? Uh, Christine or oyster sloop, Christine? That's right. So we'll get into all this today, but yeah, I, I'm grateful to to look. I don't live too far from where you are. I have friends who are members of the yacht club in my neighborhood. So I texted my buddy Eric, mm-hmm. and I was like, dude, I'm interviewing. George Ellis from the Waterfront Center this morning, and because uh, he he's a guy who does the, these regattas around around yeah. Long Island and stuff like that, so we'll have to connect that afterwards. Yeah. But I was just like, it's exciting to me to know this stuff. But but there's so much like I live here for a long time, and I've never been to your your facility without yeah. Jamee calling me. So this goes to like one of the things I think a lot of us in the sector are like when they say, "Well, we're the best kept secret." But nobody wants to be the best kept secret. You don't want to be. You don't. And it's exceeding, you know, there's everybody's competing for for eyes, eyeballs, right? And for, you know, to get the message out. And and we do, you know, we do the best we can. And social media has been amazing. And yeah. we've really been trying to maximize our message through social media. But, you know, again, being a nonprofit, trying to, you know, we do do some print ads and things like that, but that gets pretty pricey, right? So you have to kind of balance, you know, what you can do. But in any event, um, we still do seem to reach, I mean, we, we generally reach in excess of 20,000 people annually here at the Waterfront Center. So we're still doing something right in terms of getting the word out. But back to your, just back to your question, for me personally, how I got connected with the Waterfront Center um, was exactly what you said when you, when you opened things up was connections, you know, um, I, I kind of was introduced to sailing uh, at an, in the water uh, and early uh, in my life with, you know, family member who was a big sailor, um, but didn't really kind of grow up, you know, as a water person or a sailor. A lot of sailors sort of have it through their family and, you know, spend their, spend their lives, uh, you know, on the water from a very young age. That wasn't my experience, but um, my introduction to sailing early on definitely showed me that it was something that I really loved. And then I had an opportunity. uh, So I was able to sail, you know, kind of big boats and things here and there was when I was younger. But then I had the opportunity to uh, to join a yacht club at a relatively young age um, and started sailing sunfish, you know, myself kind of in my late teens. And uh, and that's when I started to kind of get into it on my own uh, and and sort of took it from there. Then um, got married, moved down to Atlanta for a little bit, was pulled very far away from the water for a number of years. Uh, but then had the opportunity to come back to New York and at that point started to have children. And it was definitely something where I was going to introduce my kids to sailing. And so, so I did, and, and it, it, my son in particular sort of took it to a very competitive level and ended up sailing internationally and, and whatnot. So it was great. So a lot of what I could do for myself was sort of on hold as you take care of your children and you give them the opportunities, you know, I'm aware of that right now. I, that's, that's where I am. I'm in that. It's all about, right. Yeah. So in any event, um, so as he kind of transitioned out from his youth sailing and, and uh, you know, got older, it provided me the opportunity to get back into it. So as a result of that, um, I, I became a member of Sawanica Corinthian Yacht Club over here in Oyster Bay in Center Island. And through that's where the connections were made through the Waterfront Center. But however, um, I became familiar with the Waterfront Center before that 
with sailing regattas that they hosted that my son participated in. Oh, yeah. So that's how I became familiar with it. And then with the, with the connections, you know, being at Swanica and Oyster Bay, had the opportunity to become a member of, of the board. And, uh, you know, I have been involved in youth sailing in, in various capacities, was on the board of the United States Optimist Dinghy Association and things like that. So that experience was something that the board here was looking at. Um, obviously, every board likes to have a variety of experiences that people do. So I my youth sailing experience and having managed in different capacities there uh, with other boards, you know, was was what got me to the board here. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's just became more aware of what great things this organization does, you know, and what I've, what I've become, what I, what's become very apparent to me, um, having become the executive director of the Waterfront Center now, is that people view the Waterfront Center in the capacity that they connect to it with, right? So if somebody's a sailor, it's a sailing organization. Mm -hmm. If somebody's, you know, into kayaking or paddleboard, that's what it is. You know, it's a place where you get to do that. And then there's the whole education component. Component. The point I'm trying to make is that we are such a diverse for for what we are. You know, our size, and and we have so many different things going on that we truly can relate to many different kinds of people. But we're a lot deeper than people think we are. So it's it's really become a fascinating thing to me, and it's a much more complex organization than what it may appear to be, you know, on the surface, so to speak. So I, I wonder even, and I don't know if you shared this with me in the past or if it's just something that's coming to me from kind of from the ether, but like from your perspective, be, did you see the organization even as a board member as a sailing organization because that was your viewpoint right paradigm you came from and were your eyes even I think you did say I think we were walking down the pier and I think you did say something like that so can you can you talk about that and how you it even opened your own eyes absolutely and you know and, and this may just be my own experience uh maybe my own ignorance I don't know but it just to me being on the board and I was on the board for about five years before becoming executive director ended up becoming vice president of the board um it just, yeah, even at that level, sure, I was aware of, obviously, you know, what all the activities of the organization were. But again, I think you just kind of have this bias. Right. Um, but coming into the, the board and then understanding how deeper the organization is, certainly, you know, I did. However, the appreciation for what it takes to make all those pieces work together, I think, didn't really hit me hard until you know, you're in the hot seat. And now you have to make it all work together, you know, but, you know, regard that's, that's all just kind of management stuff and whatever. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that the waterfront center is truly uh, an amazing organization. Yeah. And, and I feel privileged to be a part of it um, was privileged to be a board member. How I became the executive director was um, in January of 2020, the current executive director who had been here for about 10 years had um, had, had left and the, the president of the board, Ian Gumprecht, uh, and I stepped in as interim executive directors, naturally, right, um, to kind of see the day to day. We began an executive director search and, um, you know, had a couple of, you know, candidates in mind, but then the shutdown hit. Yeah. And once that happened, everything went upside down, right? And the or we weren't sure whether we were going to continue to be able, continue to be able to operate so it's sort of we went on life support uh in many different ways so i became very much involved in the day-to-day -day activities and was in a sort of transition period in my career i had a career in finance that was my career um but was in a transition phase so you know i think things just happen for a reason and, and this came along so to speak at a time where i could devote the time to it and really appreciated so much of what the organization did and and does and so really wanted to see it through and worked very hard to do that and i'm proud to say that through some of the um essential businesses that that the state determined meaning you can at that time you could rent non-motorized uh you know vehicles and things right so we could do our sailboat rentals we could do our kayaks and paddleboards um, and we were able to operate. 
and and again thinking about this everything it was march of 2020 which right. seems like yesterday and then seems like 25 years ago at the same time <laughs> oh it's like i get these you know i graduated high school in 96 and sometimes i wake up and i go oh, i didn't study for that earth science test and that earth science test happened 27 25 years ago or something man right. so like and so it feels like that with with coronavirus pandemic but i, I at that time i guess being outside april may right coming into yeah. the season it made sense so you guys you were able to take advantage if there's a way to say it right we we're able to take advantage of it um and so we saved you know we were able to kind of you know save things for us we weren't able to do our benefit fundraising like everybody else does their parties and so you know obviously financially you know things you know turned upside down stock market took a big hit if you remember um so we were really on the heels but you know, the thing for us was we wanted to continue to operate. How can we continue to provide our service to the public? And thankfully, we were able to do so. And that's where, and I'm happy to say, too, that we did not, we were able to retain all of our employees during that time. Home run. Uh, and and it, was, it was very, you know, personally satisfying. But what it gave me early on was uh, the passion that people have for this organization. And you know, even though, you know, we're not out there saving the world, right? You know, we're not curing cancer. We're not doing, we're not providing, we're not a food pantry. We're not doing that kind of stuff. But we provide sort of mental relief for people, yeah. right? And I saw that big time during the pandemic when people could come down here and get out on the water and we did it safely. And there's no case of COVID being traced back to our operation during that time. Oh. I can't remember the numbers offhand, but we served God, I mean, thousands of people. I think it was like seven or 8,000 people during the summer, if not maybe more. We needed that, It was amazing. And we needed that sort of stuff, man, too. We right. were all, look, we were all scared. You know, it, it was certainly a scary time. We don't need to go rehash that on this program, but no. we needed a relief. We needed a release. We needed respite, right? And and, right. You, and having been to, to your space, having been out there, not gone on the Christine yet, although I do want to come out and, and go for a, you know, uh, take my wife out and go. Definitely. For, you know, we'll make that happen. But that just to, uh, yeah, I could see that. And and I remember how we were all shut up in these, in our homes, you know, I, look, you know, living out here in Long Island and, and having a, a single family home, I think it's, I, I always felt for the people who were in the boroughs, you know, it's Manhattan to a certain extent, for sure. Yes. Different parts of the city. Some people are all set. They got plenty of room maybe, but you know, I just, I couldn't imagine. I, I was cooped up in, in a four bedroom house. You know, there were six of us, but it wasn't like the worst thing in the world. You know, right, exactly. uh, I had a nice backyard. I would often go there to find myself, you know, but um, it, it, it's, I could see and having experienced, certainly hanging with your staff, having experienced the space, how it could be that kind of, kind of, I go there. So we'll, we got to go to break. We're way over, but this is how I do it sometimes. But I sit on the board of Horse Ability on the campus of SUNY Old Westbury. Katie McGowan, the founder, very good buddy of mine. And she was actually the first ever guest on this, this particular show, Philanthropy and Focus, way back in uh, in January of last year. And um, I go there to find my peace because the horses, uh, my same friend, Eric, across the street, we were talking this morning. He goes, what was I saw a video with you and were those goats or sheep? What was that? I go, no, no, no. Those are the minis. I was at, I stopped by their golf outing, horse ability. They played at Hempstead Country Club on one on Monday and they got the mini horses there. I'm telling you something, George, it's, it's nature. There's something about the horses. There's something about being on the water. It's just oh. we're you know caught up in front of these machines behind these desks and things. We need to get out. We need to see the greenery. We need to just connect with nature. Right. That's right. And that's what um, again, it was it was like, you know, it was a, it was a slam in the face during the pandemic. But I've come to really see how people what we provide to people access to the water learning about it in all its different forms sailing and and kids on the beach and you know touching you know sea creatures it, yeah. it is something that people need and that passion and that you know helping people to just you know uh just you know lose themselves in it and 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 learn about it it's that connection to nature we're, we're part of something, man. We're part of something so much bigger. Look, you, yeah. you know, I'm a, I feel myself going into it. I'm going to start it, but look, right. we're, we're all connected. We're supposed to be connected. We're supposed to be looking out for each other. And you know, I do a second show. Everybody knows that here in the network called the Professionals and Animal Lovers Show. So it ain't just about this species. It's about all these species. We're supposed to be looking out. And I've seen the work your team has done. And I want to go to some of these classes on the, the marine exploration. But we'll get into that. We are going to take a quick break. I hear your passion for this organization. I love that the arc of the story, how 
when you were at the helm, haha, wink, wink, a little, little sailing humor, right? When you when you got to the helm of this thing, I'll go even further. The waters were choppy. Things were difficult. There was a storm of brewing. And look, I'm like a poet. There was a storm of brewing, but you, you know, having been able to maintain and get through all that and run the organization, it's one of these things where now we're stronger for it, we're better for it, and now we're, we can onward and upward. So we're going to take a quick break. George Ellis, Executive Director of the Waterfront Center right here, Oyster Bay, Long Island, is on the show. We'll be right back, just about a minute. Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy, and I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your conscious consultant. And on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you on edge? Hey, we live in challenging, edgy times, so let's lean in. I'm Sandra Bargeman, the host of The Edge of Every Day, which airs each Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Tune in live with me and my friends and colleagues as we share stories and perspectives about pushing boundaries and exploring our rough edges. That's The Edge of Every Day on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Nonprofits need connections to move in good directions. So come to all the static. Join Tommy in his attic. That's right. Go through all that static. Push it away. Get through the static. Join me in the attic. Only song in the history of songs about a guy doing a radio show in his attic. I think. I'm not sure, but I'm going to just say it. I'm not certified to make that comment, but I'm just going to say it anyhow. Look, the Waterfront Center really comes out of, in the late 1980s, a real estate development proposal threatened the former Jacobson shipyard on the shoreline of Oyster Bay. We, you know, um, Never doubt that a, a small group of concerned citizens can change the world. In fact, it is the only thing that ever has, Margaret Mead. Concerned about the impact of this development, the Oyster Bay Harbor Friends of the Bay nonprofit group got together with the late Senator Ralph Marino and former state Senator Carl Marcelino and other electeds to say, there's something we need to do here. There's something that we, that needs to change. We we can't let this go. And that's what it is. It takes concerned citizens. So just to kind of set that up, George, that, you know, that plan uh, kind of evolved into what turned into the Waterfront Center uh, in 2000, as you started to mention earlier. Yeah, no, it did. Uh, and, and, it's, and, and it's amazing. And what I've come to really appreciate um, about this community is their passion for the community. And, you know, we're just one cog in it, but there are so many other organizations here in Oyster Bay um, and, and, and the, the services that they provide and, and you know, what, what these organizations do to maintain quality of life in this area uh, is, is amazing. And um, the Waterfront Center is just, just one, one of those organizations. But I have to say, yes, this was a, a shipyard for many years. Uh, a very active shipyard, very popular uh, in the area here. And they built many different types of ships, some military ships and different things. Um, and yes, it became a super fun site in the eighties and shut down. So then of course, naturally you've got the, the, the battle over what to do with this prime real estate. Right. Because right away, somebody wants to, we got to develop it, man. Right. right? We got to put homes there. We got to put townhouses. We got to put condos. Right. And what's interesting is you may, 
you know, you may hear, certainly we hear a lot of this down in Florida where a lot of waterfront land that was public land or marinas or places where people could keep boats and access water has all gone to development. And so the amount of, of recreation land that is on the water is, is just is shrinking. And so the fact that, that this was preserved um, as a public space was pretty amazing. And I have to say, um, yes, there were a number, I wasn't around back then, but I you know, certainly, certainly am aware of uh, and had the privilege of meeting some of these folks that were very big proponents of making this happen. Yeah. Uh, and Senator Carl Marcelino uh, is, is, a, is a big, was a big advocate and is still a big supporter of the Waterfront Center. And we really appreciate that. But it, it was a vision of uh, you know, public and private. And I think that's another real success story here too. And the state of New York, the town of Oyster Bay, um, you know, and, and just for us here with the Waterfront Center, um, we really appreciate the support, their support, and we appreciate the relationship we have with them because we are on their land. We are on the Western Waterfront, which is what became of the, the former Jacobson's, you know, uh, shipyard site. Um, is is land that is owned co-owned both by the state of new york and the town of oyster bay mm -hmm. so it's a little bit of a it's an interesting you know web but basically we sit in the building that was the former jacobson office that's where we are but it's owned by the by the state and or the pier where we have our docks and access to the water is actually town of oyster bay <laughs> so we have you know it's it's that it's that relationship with these with these folks but they're it, incredible relationship they're very supportive of us and and we wouldn't be able to do without them so we just want to shout out to yeah you know to them and, and thank you for their support yeah I, I love that because you know look uh politicians sometimes get caught up in in this not sometimes i'm sure every day they get caught up in this mix of you know special interest and who who has the influence over them and whatnot and money and all these things uh and you really got to give kudos to the fact that these individuals were, <clears throat> excuse me, were swayed by the importance of education and were swayed by the importance of protecting these areas. Excuse me one second. And were swayed by that value versus what often becomes, you know, the business interest and let's develop the land. And I mean, we we're, let's talk about it. We are, we do live on an island, you and I, mm -hmm. there's finite coastland, you know, both North and South. It's limited, it, you know, it, it's just like everything else on, on the planet. Uh, it, it's a limited resource. And, you know, the developers come in and they want to develop because people want to be on the water and things like that. But it, it's really shout out to those folks who've done that for you in the past. And I'm sure those relationships continue to exist because, like you said, you're a tenant on their land. So you're always having these conversations. So that that's great. So um, I, I'm, I always appreciate that conversation, that it is that acknowledgement and recognition for the work. And, and then we started the show. You said it before. We started the show about relationships and connections because that's what it is. It's all about at the end of the day, we're just people and we're trying to make this a better place for everybody we can. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So again, so we had this 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 battle and, and the public space went out. Plan D, as it was called, which is which provided for the development of a marine education and recreation facility so hence the waterfront center but they had but it is a private you know nonprofit 501c3 so you had to have forces behind that uh, and there's a gentleman by the name of fritz kuder who was the big driving force behind creating the waterfront center uh along with a woman who is uh was our president for a very long time and also served as a brief role as executive director uh and a long standing board member, um, Jamie Deming. Uh, just if there's anybody that embodies the passion of the Waterfront Center, it's Jamie. And there's so many people that I could mention. Um, certainly, of course, uh, the organization is 22 years old. There's a lot of people that have, that have served to further the cause. Um, the list goes on and on. And, and an organization like this can never succeed and, and last this long without the passion of many different people. Um, but certainly in the early days and, and helping to see it through those, you know, those two folks, you know, figure, figure very large. But I have to tell you, the support that we get from the community is amazing. Um, you know, we do have corporate support and foundation support. We have those listed on our, on our website. Um, and, you know, again, we couldn't do it without them. 
But what uh, I think is the real driving force behind support of the Waterfront Center, individuals, individuals yep. in the community mostly who see the value of having this facility. And like you said, Tommy, you know, we're surrounded by water here on Long Island. And yes, we do have public beaches and that's wonderful, right? However, being able to actually experience the water in a different way, you know, yep. learn how to sail, get on a kayak, um, you know, for kids and adults too, to get in the water and, you know, pick up, you know, a, a, you know, a clam or pick up this and a horseshoe crab and, and learn about it and really get to, people don't really know, you know, we see them, but we don't really know. There's so many interesting things that you learn about and that's what we teach. It just changes people's perspective. 100%. And we're just sort of creating, you know, we like to say we create stewards of the marine environment and, and, that's, and that's a big passion of what drives uh, the whole organization. You know, I want to write that down, create stewards of the the marine environment. And, you know, I just jotted down a friend of mine's name, Beth Balkeister. She's up in Oyster Bay, but she runs an organization called Career Day, Inc., and, and, and I'm on the board of directors for that organization. They go into schools and do career days. Um, I'm thinking we need to get somebody, certainly, from the Waterfront Center there. Uh, but because, or not but, but I'm thinking as as it is, it's exposure to different things. You know, somebody who may never have, again, I grow, I've been on silent my whole life. I mean, if I've left for a week for vacation, that's about it. I, I stayed here for college, the whole thing. So um, there's so much of this island I've not experienced. You know, I, I would say my knowledge of, of, <laughs> of what's, what lies beneath the water isn't so great. And that's just about exposure. Right. And, and that's, you know, there's, there's, there is a limitation on how much information we can access at one time uh but you can change someone's life you can change someone's paradigm you can change the trajectory of their their journey by exposing them to stuff somebody you know some young person has come to the waterfront center i don't know his or her name but they've experienced it and then they now their their mind is open to other things their mind is open and, and broadened and they're saying well maybe i can go into this Maybe I can be a marine biologist, or certainly I can be, but I didn't even know there was a thing such like that, right? And and that's I can make a living doing that, and I could be on the water 9, 10, 12 months out of the year doing the thing. Like it's just so cool, man. That's that's what it is. But it's about it, it's uh, it's about empowering people, it's about exposing people to different things. So we are we're gonna take another quick break. We come back, I want to jump into uh programs, and then I wanna there's something. I don't know if you know the guys from an organization called Sail Ahead. I know uh, Killian and Sean Duclay um, and their family, they take veterans out sailing. Yes. Uh, I, so they do really special work for the month of July. All the programs on, on philanthropy and focus were veterans based organizations. So I, I, I know you guys have a similar program, a program where you take uh, individuals with intellectual developmental disabilities and, and special needs and, and veterans out. So maybe we could talk about that when we come back. So let's come back next segment. We're going to talk about programming and eventually we'll get to the point where, you know, you've had such great support financially and otherwise, but I know you need more because we all do. So we could talk about future and things like that. How's that sound, George? Sounds good. All right, good. We'll go to a quick break. Philanthropy in focus. Are you passionate about the conversation around racism? Hi, I'm Reverend Dr. TLC, host of the Dismantle Racism Show, which airs every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Join me and my amazing guests as we discuss ways to uncover, dismantle, and eradicate racism. That's Thursdays at 11 o'clock a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a small business trying to navigate the COVID-19 related employment laws? Hello, I'm Eric Sauver, employment law business law attorney and host of the new radio show, Employment Law Today. On my show, we'll have guests to discuss the common employment law challenges business owners are facing during these trying times. Tune in on Tuesday evenings from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time on talkradio.nyc.
Hey, everybody, it's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy in Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Nonprofits need connections to move in good directions. So come through all the static. Join Tommy in his attic. All right, we're back. You've already decided to join me in the attic or you wouldn't have heard the song, so you're already here. So let's get going. George Ellis is here, the Waterfront Center, Oyster Bay, Long Island. Uh, George is the executive director out there. I want to go into programming. I wrote down sailing, marine exploration, harbor tours, kayaks. I know my wife came out with the Girl Scouts. Cameron hooked them up. Cameron, what's up, Cam? Um, your team out there, Lauren and Jamee and the gang. I mean, just so, and I love what I, you know what I love on the website too is you actually, the website shows everybody. It's not a website where it's like, here's the ED, here's the VP of this or that. It actually lists and shows a photograph of your your whole team, which is, that's community, man. I love I love that you guys do it that way. Um, so let's talk about some of these programs, though. That, you know, obviously sailing is is kind of was, was your, as we talk about your background and connection to this, but kind of walk me through some of those programs. Now, you know, and, and thanks for mentioning the team, of course. Um, and, you know, again, I, I use this word a lot but it's because it's true. Uh, the passion that this team has for what they do really inspires me, you know? And again, it's not, um, I had a whole totally different career and I love to sail, but as you just mentioned, this organization is a lot deeper than sailing. And um, uh, not that sailing isn't great, but there's a lot more going on. Right? And so what I've come to appreciate is just the passion that our team brings to it. And they inspire people. And I love, you know, being a part of that and watching that. And, and yes, absolutely. It is all about the team. It's not about me. Um, you know, I don't need to be on the website, you know, honestly, and I feel like I work for them. I'm like, you know, you guys tell me what we need to be doing. Let's, let's do the, let's lock arms and let's get it done together. Um, yeah, I've got my ideas here and there and whatnot, but I mean, it really is a team effort and, and I love the passion that this team brings to it. And, uh, at the end of the day, it just translates to, uh, a good experience for the public. And that's what we're all about. Um, but so, uh, yes, we, so we, the, we do have two main sides to organization. We've got the education side, which are uh, education directors, Cameron, Janesse, and then we have our sailing side. Their sailing director is, um, is John Brendel. Mm -hmm. So through those two sides is kind of where everything flows. Um, let me just start with education because it really is a, a, an important part of what we do. And, uh, with our education, we've got a couple of different things. Throughout the year, we run programming for school groups and scout groups, and they will come to the Waterfront Center down in our basement that you painted. We've got a touch <laughs> that you saw, right? <laughs> Everything comes from the water right in front of us in Oyster Bay. So yeah. we pull these things out of the water and, and they're in the touch tank and the kids come. It's like when you go to the aquarium and they've yeah. got those, you know, um, so similar deal. And it's all sorts of interesting things uh, that come out of the water that most people don't even realize. Um, just really cool. Uh, so they come here and they do that, but they also learn about wind, you know, wind power and, and all, all different aspects of the environment um, that, that, I mean, our naturalists are, are amazing and what they teach and, and, and what they, and what the kids learn is, is really great. So that, um, so we have schools groups that come here, scout groups that come here. We go out to organizations and we bring a touch tank to the school or, or to the camp or whatever you want to call it. And we bring the waterfront center to, to the community, to the various communities. So we do that. And, uh, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, we also have a junior summer program where kids come in the summer and they, they do what we call marine exploration activities. Um, similar type of deal, except it's extended and they, um, you know, the, they're here, it's, there's two half day programs and they go down to the beach. And by the way, 
all year round we take kids down to the beach and we sane nets and all that kind of stuff what, what do you mean let's stop there for a second what do you mean all year round you're like when it's cold out sure let's go well, yeah into november kids will come absolutely get some jackets on go down to the water it's fantastic you know um so, just, so, yeah we do i'm just goofing on you i'm goofing because i i don't I, I i've been here my whole life 44 years and counting and i i I love the winter less every year. And, <laughs> and I didn't love it to begin with, to be honest with you. But well, I guess it had been more more mild. And I will, I think the winters have been more mild because I used to bundle up, man. Sometimes I pull off just a hoodie and a hat like for the whole winter these days. You know, I don't think it's I don't think it's bad as it was. I want to talk about the the exploration activities in the summer. What's the age groups there? Because I want to, you know, I do have four children and, you know, I would love them to get into some programming like this next year. Right, exactly. Well, it goes like age, uh, everybody's going to kill me, like six, seven, you know, oh, wow. typically around, you know, 14, 15, okay. of the typical age, you know, yeah, that's, but that's actually kind of in that age. All my kids fit in that, all four fit in that range, so we can work that out. That's good. Absolutely. And every week is a different, uh, it's a different topic that that we teach and um i don't have that list in front of me now but it's it's yeah, really, okay. it's really it's wonderful totally it's wonderful. Like the diversity of it right and then um we have uh our sailing activity and you know kids come and, and learn how to sail in various boats we've got opties which are wonderful for younger kids to learn how to sail we have 420s double-handed we have sonars which are 23 foot keel boats um, and then we also have a J105, which is a, which is a 34 foot, uh, kind of cruiser racer. And we, that's what we use for our big boat program. So I remember being out there. So I do have to say shout out to Shannon Kelly, cause Shannon will kill me if I don't, cause I, she's my buddy when I come out and visit. So I'm looking at the website, Shannon who handles marketing out there. So I, yeah, I just yeah. want to make sure I'm hitting on all the friends that I've met, John Brendel. So, um, you know, talk about like these the competitive john i mean i remember when i was out there was telling me he races competitively like that's right. these are like you know these are folks who live and breathe this stuff that are in the i don't say in the trenches wrong wrong analogy there but that are on the boats that are doing this stuff day in and day out so two things i want to comment about that is how cool is that if that's your career and that's something you love and that's how you get paid like that's pretty special but then how to your word passion before of course they're passionate they're in their world they're in their flow all day long man they're in their space you know that's what it is and so for any kids you know listen in in most particularly on the sailing front a lot of uh you know learn learn to sail it kind of kids in yacht club yacht club programs right that tends to be where kids learn how to sail um and so what we provide is that opportunity for kids who may not otherwise have that yeah. uh, you know they may not be introduced to that we provide that here and you don't have to have your own boat we provide the boat um uh, and it's and it's is a lot it attainable? is it attainable because let's be, let's be honest let's like you and let's just break it down this lifestyle sometimes comes with well that's expensive that's costly i can't do that i can't reach that i can't touch that that's out of my league let's just be honest we know how society is there's different scenarios i, I want to know does the water send the waterfront center make this attainable for regular folks we do make it attainable. first of all um it's all relative right so yes i'm not going to say that uh you know it's all relative but yeah. we do, you know it is it's a cost it's costly to run the program right okay. it's costly boats cost a lot um, you know, having qualified staff, everything. However, um, yes, we do uh, subsidize our programming again through the support of our benefactors. Yeah. And, and that's a huge thing. And the other thing that we do is for those in need, and I really want to stress this, for yeah. those in need, we have a scholarship program right. and we want to utilize that program. It's on our website, you know, thewaterfrontcenter.org. Um, and there is a scholarship program. There's an application and we want to provide that opportunity for everybody here. And, and let me just go a little further to say, we work with the other organizations in this community that do that. Mo most specifically, Youth and Family Counseling, okay. an organization here in Oyster Bay that provides services to at-risk uh, families and children. Uh, and we run a program where uh, you know, they have a group of kids that come here during the summer uh, and sometimes in other parts of the season of the year. Uh, where the programming is, if it's not free, it's really close to it. Yeah. And that's what we want to do. And that's also why, Tommy, why you mentioned our disabilities program. It's called ZigZag. Mm -hmm. We take our 23-foot boats and we 
you know, anybody with even we've even had, you know, those with with vision, you know, blind, you know, whatever, <laughs> people with vision issues out on the boats, which is amazing. Yep. And we've got adaptive equipment for those that have certain physical disabilities to be able to get on there. And that's completely free of charge. And we also have a veterans program, as you mentioned, where we provide for veterans to go out sailing and you'll have to take an instructor if you need to, completely free of charge. And we're very proud of providing that programming to the community. And I just found, uh, I wrote it down, Youth and Family Counseling. I just shared that on Facebook. For those of you checking in on Facebook, it's out there on the link right now. But that website is yfcaoysterbay.org, yfcaoysterbay.org. What is better, in my mind, than two nonprofits getting together and collaborating for the community and making things better. I want to learn more about that organization at some point. I want to come out and support what you guys are doing specifically with that zigzag program. And also uh, when you're uh, working with the adaptives because of the adaptive boats, because I'll sh we have this, my cousin Linda passed away about, uh, I guess it's nine, it must be 10 years now. And we have the Lindy Lou Foundation in memory of Linda. And I, I will tell you everybody, that was probably one of the things that drew me to the nonprofit sector. It's how I got hooked up with Spirit of Huntington Art Center um, because they have an artworks program. I'm on the board there. And that artworks program is for uh, young adults when they age out of the school system so they can learn digital media, digital arts work, and they do incredible work. In fact, our company, which was called Vanguard Insurance Agency, is now called Vanguard Benefits. We just finished our rebrand. Our website just went live, vanguardbenefitsu.com. I never talk about business on the show, but I'm feeling like that all is sort of related because the spirit of Huntington Arts Center, these individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities who just learn a different way have done incredible work for us. We use it for our brand. We also used, but well, we had them do the Bayside Business Association where I'm on the board. Uh, we had them do the website. So, and the rebrand, Mission Vision Valley, all that type of stuff. But I will tell you, so Lindy Lou, Lindy Lou drew me to a lot of the sector. In fact, it's how I met Katie McGowan, Horseability. <laughs> As I think of it, Lindy Lou, Linda, I love you. We miss you. And that Linda really connected me to a lot of this world. But I want George, where I'm going with this is I want to talk to you about, uh, we have our big event in March for the Lindy Lou Foundation. All the money we raise goes to organizations that are serving the special needs community or the IDD community. So come back to me, Jamea, I know you're listening. Come back to me on that, Jamea, and talk to me about how we can support some of that with some dollars. Talk about support, Tommy D. Really good segue. Way. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about how you can support this organization, what George and his team need, and how we can make connections. It's going to be a lightning round. George, we'll be right back. Get ready. Lightning round coming up. Got it. <laughs> hey, everybody. It's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector, coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy in Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. In a post-COVID world, you may have many unanswered questions regarding your health. Are you looking to live a healthier lifestyle? Do you have a desire to learn more about mental health and enhance your quality of life? Or do you just want to participate in self-understanding and awareness? I'm Frank R. Harrison, host of Frank About Health, and each Thursday, I will tackle these questions and work to enlighten you. Tune in every Thursday at 5 p.m. on talkradio.nyc, and I will be Frank About Health to advocate for all of us. Calling all pet lovers. Pet Avengers, assemble! On the Professionals and Animal Lovers show, we believe the bond between animal lovers is incredibly strong. It mirrors that bond between pets and their owners. Through this program, we come together to learn, educate, and advocate. Join us live every Wednesday at 2 p.m. at talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Nonprofits need connections to move in good directions. So cut through all the static. Join Tommy in his attic. All right, we're back. Jealous executive director of the Waterfront Center. All right, let's let's really talk about this, George. I saw some of the organizations that support 
businesses and otherwise that support the organization right now. I sort Farrell Fritz. I'm looking to see, uh, I don't know where I sort on your website. So I'm trying to see that again, if I could find it, but talk to me about those who have supported and, and what you need and what's upcoming. If there's events, I know you said during 2020, a lot of that was uh, put aside. Um, but talk to us about what you need. And actually, if we can shout out before we even do that, tell me about the Christine 130 year old, 138 year old oyster sloop. It was just oyster fest up in oyster Bay. So tell me, give me like 30 seconds on that. And then let's talk about connections. That's right. So I've got a, uh, you know, nice little painting oh, behind me there. Hello, Christine. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, Christine is on the national historic register and she is our flagship, uh, for the, uh, you know, for the waterfront center. And we actually like to say she represents Oyster Bay. She was built in 1883 um, by a captain in Glenhead, uh, New York, and she uh, worked Oyster Bay Harbor harvesting oysters. So there isn't anything more related to Oyster Bay than that. Um, and so she had through, over the years, she had passed through numerous different owners and gone to many different harbors and was eventually found somewhat in disrepair over in Mystic, Connecticut wow. uh, in, in the 90s. And there was a, again, you know, a passionate group of, you know, people in Oyster Bay, um, you know, a number of folks who are part of Friends of the Bay and another organization here in town that's, that's very environmentally focused and shout out to them, uh, big supporters of the Waterfront Center. Uh, they brought the vessel over, literally towed it back over to Oyster Bay, um, formed the Christine Oyster Sloop Preservation Corporation set up in one of the former Jacobson buildings that are down along our property and set out to restore her. And then donated the vessel. And of course, a lot of donations, a lot of support for that. And then donated to the vessel to the Waterfront Center to become our floating classroom. Home run, floating classroom. Where do you get that but on Long Island and a special nonprofit organization? So cool. Again, yeah, Margaret Mead, right? Concerned group of citizens, small group of citizens changing the world. That's a, Hey, I say this all the time. No big deal. We're just changing the world. George, how do we help you continue to change the world on, on the Waterfront Center? So, you know, again, what we do, the only way we could do this, as we all know, access to the water uh, is limited. Anything related to getting on the water is expensive. You know, you mentioned that, right? Um, and we can't avoid that. And we don't try to ignore that topic, you know, in terms of, you know, getting out and sailing and all that, like it's great to learn how to sail, but then when you take it from there, what do you do? It's, it costs you money. Okay. However, um, just learning those skills and having that experience, I think is a life-changing thing. So mm -hmm. for anybody, it doesn't need to necessarily become a lifelong passion. And if it does, that's wonderful. Um, but learning and understanding, learning how the wind works, learning how the water uh, impacts things, it's just, we're all better off for it. So regardless, however, what we always can use is just more and more support. Um, grants, you know, one thing that we have noticed is that we could serve more and more schools. However, two things that are always an issue is, is, is funding for schools, right? For these kinds of things. As we all know, a lot of that has become limited over the years. And what we would love to be able to do and what we do from, uh, from time to time is we love to get funding in order to be able to provide deeply discounted programming to schools and for teachers to bring their school groups here uh, yeah. where it, it doesn't have to cost them anything. Sure. Sure. We don't want it to be a financial barrier for kids to learn about the marine environment. And that's what we strive to, uh, to do further. I, I want to ask, is there, um, is there certain, and if I'm putting you on the spot, you don't have an answer, that's okay, but is there a certain wish list of maybe companies or organizations locally that you'd really love to partner up with? Because I talk a lot about strategic alliances and the, the for-profit and non-profit getting together. Is there anybody that you have your eyes on as an organization that maybe we can help make that happen? I know I'm putting you on the spot, so I'm okay if you don't have somebody. Yeah, not, I mean, nothing offhand, and I think that we've got great partnerships um, you know, with, with those that are out there, and, and you see our Again, if you go to our website, you can see who our corporate sponsors are, and there's a lot more uh, individuals and foundations that are anonymous behind that. Um, so, but, you know, I think we would just love to learn about uh, other sort of grant opportunities. Transportation, transportation is a big issue. 
right? Uh, you know, you've heard about sort of bus driver shortages, yeah. uh, you know, these days, the cost of getting a bus, yeah. um, you know, which is one of the reasons why my focus, and I think I said this to you when you came to visit, is what are you looking, what's, what's my strategy for, you know, the immediate future for the Waterfront Center is to bring the Waterfront Center out to the community more. You uh, have a vehicle that does that right now? We do. We have a we have a vehicle. I like to call it the mobile marine unit. Everybody laughs at me around here when I say that. Uh, I'm famous for my dad jokes. You I, know, say, I, I know them well. I'm I'm actually infamous for mine. I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you. You know, back to horseability for a second. They have a minivan that right. they that they put the minis in. There's these. I think I said it today. The mini horses. So it's so it's so cute. They get they take them out to senior centers and stuff like that. But. Where, as I promised you last night, we were going to run out of time way before we ran out of words. And right. I think I win. I win that one. So we, we, because we are right now out of time. Any, let's leave them with, to go to the website, you're going to go to, to all spelled out, thewaterfrontcenter.org. If somebody wants to get involved with programming, who do they call? Uh, they, would, they would give a call, uh, you know, here to our main number, 516-922-7245. Okay. Uh, and anybody here who answers the phone is sure. well versed in what we do. Sure. Uh, of course, they can always ask for me. Happy to talk to anybody, but you know anybody at the staff here is is well versed. I love it. I, this is great, George. I'm I'm excited to have had this conversation. Um, I, I want to do whatever I can to help tell the story again for the organization and consider me a friend. And listen, I'm not too far away. So I, as I'm sitting here, I'm going. As I'm standing here, I'm saying man, I should learn how to sail. My friend Eric across the street who just texted me, I was telling him about the, you being on the show and he goes, are you doing the show with, with the horses or without the horses? I go, there's no horses on this show. We're on the water. But he would love it if I became a sailor. So maybe I have to come by and take some sailing lessons. We'll uh, we're have to figure that out. Next week on the show, I just want to mention um, many of us in our lifetime will become caregivers and Elisa Lewis will be here to talk about Nancy's House, which is an organization that provides respite to caregivers. You know, I, I, they talk about the sandwich generation, George. You know, you and me might be different in age, but we're probably both in that sandwich generation. Children and parents and people are living to a later stage in life, which is great, but it also becomes, you know, challenging on the family. So many of us are caregivers or will become caregivers. So we're going to talk about that next week on the show. George, thanks for being here. Thanks for everybody checking in. The last thing I'll say. You're welcome. Last thing I'll say, Fred Taffer, my buddy, is checking in. He noticed my T-shirt, Tombow Visual Creations. Tombo and I, Fred and I, Erico and his his wife and I, we've got come together and have a strategic alliance. So if you're a nonprofit organization or for-profit looking for swag, looking for shirts, looking for hats, looking for anything, looking for tote bags and things like that, Fred and I worked out an arrangement where he's going to provide, of course, world-class service, but premium pricing to anybody that's connected with me. So let's do that. Let's make those connections. George, make it a great day. Stay good on the water, everybody. Stay safe. I'm Tommy D. I'll see you later on. Bye now. Mm -hmm.